Good evening, everybody, and I am so excited to welcome you to our AMWA AWIMS event this evening, where we are celebrating our own SIU women physicians. My name is Dr. Vidya Prakash. I'm an infectious diseases faculty, and I also serve as Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs and Population Health and Chief Medical Officer here at SIU Medicine. I am delighted and privileged to introduce to you the co-leaders of our discussion today, stellar AMWA leaders, Jasmine James and Emily Lohman Irwin. They're both fourth year medical students here at SIU School of Medicine. Emily serves as the AMWA uh, president of our SIU chapter and Jasmine serves as vice president of our AMWA chapter. Welcome Jasmine and Emily. I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce our panelists uh, and start the panel discussion. And I will just tell everybody this is a recorded session and I will be moderating the chat. Jasmine and Emily. Hello, everybody. Um, we'd love to thank Dr. Prakash for hosting our event and setting this up. We're very excited um, to kind of do a collaboration event with AMWA and AWIMS today. We wanted to let everyone know uh, we'll have but we'll have some time for questions at the end of this session. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, go ahead and put them in the chat. And as Dr. Prakash said, she'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, and we'll get to those towards the end of our, our uh, panel today. We'd love to introduce our panelists this evening. Uh, we have Dr. Bondari with us, who is the Assistant Professor of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, we have Dr. Chua with us, who is Assistant Professor of Clinical Internal Medicine and Infectious Disease Faculty as well. Uh, we have Dr. Lack with us, who is a associate professor of clinical pediatrics. Dr. Neumeister, um, who is a plastics and reconstructive surgery resident. Dr. Nielsen, uh, who is a pulmonary and critical care fellow. And we have Dr. Zhang with us, an assist, excuse me, an assistant professor of surgery and vascular surgery faculty here with us today. Um, We'd love if all of our panelists would just go around briefly, starting with uh, Dr. Bandari and introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about kind of your initial career trajectory and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Priyanka uh, uh, and I'm a faculty here with School of Medicine at the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, I was born and brought up in India. I did my medical training in India. Uh, and I think uh, right as a youngster, I always, I, I always, I think I always wanted to become a physician. I uh, was highly influenced by our family physician who took care of our, at that time, a big giant family that uh, we had, I think 15, 20 people, but he was our, you know, like our family doctor who would cater to everybody. So he had a big influence on me and, um, I, uh, before I moved to the US, I have worked in India and Africa, and then my husband decided to move to, uh, to the United States in 2010, and I came uh, here, um, took my steps, uh, jumped into residency here in the school, uh, in our department at uh, Family and Community Medicine here in Springfield. And um, since 2016, I've been a faculty. I joined right after the, my, after, completed my residency and I've been a faculty here for almost three years now. Thank you, Dr. Brandari. Dr. Chua, would you love to introduce yourself? Thank you. Hi, I'm Francine Chua. I'm in the same division as Dr. Prakash. I'm with infectious diseases. Um, I did both my residency and my fellowship here in SIU. So I've been here for a while. Um, and uh, I did grow up and did all of my schooling, including medical schooling in um, the Philippines. Um, we have a ton of really nice infectious disease stuff going on there. And so, you know, since, since med school and since I was exposed to all of those things, I really wanted to do infectious diseases. I just fell in love with it. And um, so after, um, you know, completing my fellowship here, I just kind of stuck around Springfield. Um, and and it's been I think two years now, two and a half years that I've been around as assistant uh, professor. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really all. Thank you, Dr. Lack. 
Yes, I'm uh, Jody Black. I am an associate professor in pediatrics. I'm the division director for pediatric hospital medicine and one of the for the um, pediatrics residency. Um, I really got here into medicine by a lot of hard work, a lot of prayer, and a lot of good people me out along the way. So I think it was a combination of all three. Um, I joke around that I'm inbred um, because I went to medical school at SIU. I did residency at SIU and then was surprised and delighted when they asked me uh, to stay on as faculty um, since 2009. So I've been here quite a while. Thank you, Dr. Neumeister. So um, I'm Evan Neumeister. Um, I guess I have always been interested in medicine. I have a family member who is in medicine and would talk about how cool his job is and everything. So I, that's kind of how I initially uh, sparked my interest. But I wanted to, um, I initially was thinking pediatrics because um, I love working with kids. Yes, exactly. Um, love working with kids. Um, and then once I got to medical school and did my clerkships, I, I loved surgery. So I thought, well, I'm plastic surgery is creative, working with my hands, and I'm going to end up going into pediatric plastic surgery is my plan. So, yep, I didn't give up on that entirely. Initially, um, I think interestingly, and maybe we'll talk about it kind of later, um, initially I was thinking medical school, and then I actually applied to PA schools for um, uh, the first kind of time around because I was um, really thinking, I don't know how I'm going to balance home life and, you know, like raising a family, especially, you know, um, seeing another family member go through kind of that struggle as well. So I applied to PA school thinking maybe it'd be easier to balance it. I actually talked to Dr. Constance, um, who said, you want to go to medical school? And I was like, yes, I do. So, <laughs> so then I applied to medical school and here we are. So now I'm here. Thank you guys. Awesome, thank you. Dr. Zhang. Yes, my name is Tian uh, Nini Zhang. Um, I uh, have been in Springfield even longer than you, Dr. Lack. I've been, I wasn't born here, but um, I've been here almost my entire life, probably since, I don't know, 1990, 91 or so. Um, uh, and I'm a local um, and proud graduate of, you know, the schools here in, in Springfield, I technically Chatham. Um, and I also did medical school at SIU and my residency training here and um, was very excited to be able to join the faculty here at SIU. I'm six months in, still <laughs> still sort of making that transition, but uh, I think I've pretty much got it down now. And uh, I do have several family members who are also in medicine, uh, but the closest one, you know, were uh, grandparents. I initially had career plans, you know, all over oh. across the board. Wanted to be a musician at one point, a veterinarian. Um, there are probably some other things, a librarian at one point, because I love to read. Um, but eventually I settled on medicine and I couldn't be happier. All right. Thank you guys so much for the introduction. We're going to get started with some questions um, to kind of start on our panel. So I will let Jasmine go ahead. Yeah, I'm just making sure we got through everyone. Oh, did we? I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Nielsen, my apologies. Dr. Nielsen, okay. yeah. No, no problem. Um, I was waiting for you to say the name. So uh, no problem. I'm Beth Nielsen. I'm a Poem Crit Fellow. Um, I think a couple things kind of brought me to this, this, where I'm at today is really just friends, family, persistence, and hard work, I think is really what gets you to where you need to be. I think everyone here would probably agree with that. Um, I started out thinking I wanted to be a math teacher. Um, I have two doctors as parents. Um, they went to medical school at SIU and my dad did family medicine here. Mom started family medicine here and then went to Indiana for the rest of it. Um, but I, I thought I like my math and science. When I went to Carbondale for undergrad, I decided that one of the math classes was no longer math and I had to switch to something else because I said, I'm not going to go through this exam or this this one anymore. So then I changed to physiology and I love teaching. I did a TA when I was in anatomy, loved that and decided medicine is what I want to do. So um, 
My parents did ER most of my upbringing, so I like the shift work. So maybe that's partly why I'm in critical care now. Um, but overall, I think the what brought me to here, I mean, in this point is pul pulmonary critical care is really just the, I think it's just, you see those mentors in something and you see the mentors you've seen that are happy at what they do. And um, so that's kind of what brought me here, but yeah. Well, this is actually a perfect lead in to the next uh, uh, topic I wanted us to sort of bring to the surface. Uh, I definitely can identify with uh, the fact that many of you brought up your introduction to medicine has come from some wonderful, uh, supportive individuals around you. And I know that I have had a lot of female that have uh, been a major mentor and support as I've gone through this endeavor. Do you want to elaborate on or speak more to how uh, female mentors in particular have helped shape your career? Any person, or do you want one of us to go first? I can I can say my part. Um, I would say some of the women. Uh, my mom probably is number one, um, and I think Dr. Foray has been a huge part of my, especially in fellowship. Um, Dr. Prakash was my mentor in residency, and even before that, I had some uh, mentors on the island. I went to a Caribbean island for. Um, medical school, but I think it's just seeing the people that tell you not to give up is what kind of gets you through and show and tell you like what is worth it in the end. Yes, there's good and bad to everything, but I think those women have helped me and and that kind of helps throughout the whole thing. So, any anyone else have any particular? Um female mentors that they've had that were able to support them in a way that stood out? I can go next. So I've even through residency, I mean, Dr. Prakash, I, she, she was, she didn't know this, but I considered her one of my tour mentors, um, along with Dr. Sunderation. Um, but, uh, you know, even when I was going through residency and I was, you know, not sure well, I was going to graduate residency and I wasn't sure if I wanted to do ID. Can I do it? Um, because ID is very volume heavy and very busy. Um, you know, just, just the, you know, that they allowed me to be vulnerable, um, in their presence without judgment was very big, uh, to me. I don't know if they, they know that. Um, but, and, you know, when, when after fellowship and, you know, easing in through the whole, you know, just early career attending physician kind of place. Um, you know, every day I kind of wanted to quit. Um, just that I felt like, um, you know, with, with life happening to, um, that maybe I couldn't do it. I wasn't cut out for it, but then you look at them and, you know, they're all ID is a very women led kind of a division and that all of, you know, all of the, the women there have families. They're, they're actually keeping it together at work too, you know, just, just by example, really, and nothing really much that they're doing actively, but just by example, and just by looking at them, um, you know, I feel like it's doable. Um, and so you kind of just take it one day at a time. So, you know, I, I guess just to, the whole part of them being women, having families and still having that balance between work and, and, and having a life outside of medicine to me was, was enough of a, you know, just kind of, they're just modeling by, by just being who they are and through example. And to me, that was pretty big too. So, you know, from, from residency, um, to fellowship and then to, you know, early career, um, attending life, um, you know, they've, they've all just, just by virtue of them being women and keeping it together still, uh, throughout, you know, all of the stuff that's happened, COVID and everything. Um, you know, it was, you know, very, uh, um, um, it was a big thing to me. 
No, I thank you for sharing that. I, uh, I agree that it's, uh, it's been such an important piece for me. Um, is there anyone else that would like to share anything specific related to some advice or information they've received from that female perspective or anything, a reason why you felt that maybe you were able to connect with someone based on even just like having some sort of uh, uh, connection and that was unique? I can comment on that. Um, I think some of my female mentors at work, um, one is probably Dr. Lynn Barkmeyer, who's a vascular surgeon who works for Springfield, for Springfield Clinic, um, but she's kind of been, um, you know, a practicing physician here in the community for 20, 30 years. Um, and the other one probably would be Dr. Nada Berry with plastic surgery. Um, both of them, I think, um, you know, have shown through like what Dr. Chua said, you know, they, they really lead by example and not, you know, Nini, this is how you do this or this is how you do that, but just in the way that they interact with patients. Um, you know, there's actually a lot of continuity of care within my specialty, despite it being a surgical one. Sometimes we grumble that there's maybe too much continuity of care because we're always seeing these patients over and over. Um, but I think, you know, it's easy to feel happy and satisfied with your job you know, when patients are really happy and they're doing well and they're really grateful, but um, they're also challenging times, you know, when they have complications and, you know, they might be upset and, um, but, you know, I think uh, both Dr. Barkmeyer and Dr. Berry have shown that, you know, it's really our part of our responsibility to help patients through both the easy times as well as the hard times. And, um, you know, just through, their actions with their patients, through their interactions with colleagues um, in all sorts of fields. You know, they build up really strong reputations for themselves as, you know, caring physicians. Um, and so, you know, patients want to go see them. And Dr. Barkmeyer will know a lot, not only about, you know, the medical surgical problem that a particular patient has, but she'll ask, you know, how's your mother doing? You know, how's your father doing? I heard, you know, so and so, you know, last time they were struggling with this and that. So it really makes patients feel like she cares about them as a person. So that's been very impactful. Nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really felt it was important to tease out, uh, taking a moment to think through uh, the impact of having had uh, important mentors and that kind of support because um, it helps us to get through the obstacles that will inevitably come up. Could you now, um, if you feel comfortable sharing any uh, barriers you've experienced in your career or um, that you feel would be important to maybe bring up and uh, some advice for us as learners as far as uh, moving through that. I, I can speak to that. I faced a lot of barriers. I come from a small town in central Illinois and I faced barriers getting into medical school with people being a bit more backwards there and telling me, but you're a woman. <laughs> So if you would get into school and you would have a family, you would need to put your career on the back burner because your place is only with your family. Fortunately, that never came from my family members or my close friends, but people outside were trying to help me out. Um, I am also from a biracial family. My father is African-American and my mother is Caucasian. They married six years after it became legal in America to uh, marry uh, someone outside of your race. So you can imagine how it was for me growing up as a kid in a small town. Sometimes it was wonderful and people were very inviting and other times I did not belong there and I was judged as soon as I walked into a room because they were not happy with what I represented, a mixing of the races. Um, so in a way, I feel it was the perfect upbringing for a career as a woman in medicine because shockingly, when I was, um, a medical student and I was so excited as a resident and as a junior attending to join this group of professionals 
that blew my socks off how unprofessional they could be at times as I faced the exact same situations and problems. Um, I think other people in the group can be with me when it's occurred, but um, if I would serve on a committee, I'm not sure if it's because I'm a pediatrician or a woman or both. People would go around and say, Dr. So and so, Dr. So and so, Dr. So and so, Dr. So and so, Dr. So and so. And I took it for a while until my female colleagues started to, we started to speak to each other about it more and say, don't put up with that. They don't get to erase your education, your title anymore. Um, and so I really started coming out years ago tend to do it in a joke. That's just who I am. And I handle all things that way. Um, but I started to speak up to say, hold up there. Is it because I'm a pediatrician or because I'm a woman or both that I don't have a title? And it's amazing when you call it out first, I can do awkward as long as the day is and it stops everything. So you just have to be ready. And then people are oh, sorry, this is Dr. Lack. Thank you. <laughs> um, for all of that, but um, I think I've learned that people are people wherever you go, and it's not really a profession or a people group or a creed or a religion that do this. There are good and ignorant people wherever you go and in every group, and you will find those good people and they will support you. You will find those ignorant people. And you just need to be ready with a statement. And so many of the women that are on this panel have helped me to navigate through difficult situations. Um, but um, there are still barriers for, uh, for us as women. We're still told to be at home. You have a double tax to be at home and be at work. And you better, you better be pretty. You better be skinny. Um, <laughs> many of us can just throw to the wayside because as bond are in this, you realize none of that stuff matters. You know, what matters is how we're there for each other and for our patients and our families. Yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Lack, I love your uh, perspective on that. As a student who had both of my children during medical school, I've been very lucky at SIU to get a lot of support around that, um, but I've certainly had people outside of our school question that choice. Um, and I think it is uh, both speaking to mentorship and to barriers. I think it's been so wonderful as a female student to see people succeeding in their careers with their children, kind of balancing that work and life perspective as much as one can have balance. Um, so I think, uh, you know, thinking another question we kind of had for you guys as students was how are you managing to balance career opportunities and your life outside of medicine? Because I think that's such a challenging thing to try to navigate for for any of the panelists. Me, well, one aspect of it is when we transitioned away from pagers to Doc Halo, I really wasn't a fan. I'm still not really a fan. Um, <laughs> But, you know, kind of one way I got around it is I have a burner phone that is my Doc Halo phone. So when I'm not on call or if I'm going out of town or if I'm, you know, whatever, do you know, attending an event, I leave my work. I don't have to take my work phone with me and I don't have to worry about usually most people contacting me, you know, for work related things. So I think that has been a big help, you know. Um, I mean, yes, it means I do have to pay another phone bill that I normally wouldn't have, but I think that's a kind of a small price to pay for a little bit of, you know, personal privacy when you want it. And I completely agree with Dr. Zhang here. That was one of the, like, I think it's very important to set boundaries. Um, you know, there's a reason why. So when, you know, there's a, a schedule for a division that's laid out for who's on call or who's not. You know, like if at 6 30, I'm supposed to be off, I'm supposed to be off from 6 30 p.m. today until 6 30 a.m. tomorrow. So, you know, I, I do the same thing now. Um, I used to be, you know, giving all of myself to, to, you know, to my patients. I'm on call. I feel like 24 7, you're reachable all the time through Doc Halo. But now I actually make like an effort to, 
actually yeah, like on Doc Halo, you have the 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 ability to put yourself as on away or off call. So like on my weekends, I make sure that on the on those you know hours on on the weekends I'm supposed to be off. I'm not reachable. Um, people in my division who need to get a hold of me for for some reason know my personal number, um, and we are all I think you know very um, you know we're all very strict too about our times because you know we have our own families, so you know we try to protect those boundaries too that we set to kind of give yourself your own you know rest time or um, so you don't go nuts. And then the other thing too that that um you know uh, really that's important and and this was you know one of my biggest weaknesses and and I thought around that time was a strength too was that I was just unable to say no um and I think most women are kind of like that we're so used to multitasking we kind of just say yes to everything that's that's thrown our way um and it's kind of you know bit me um in my rear um lots of times um you know that i couldn't focus on you know um so many things now just juggling so many things and your own sanity and your own home life just isn't doable anymore when you have too many things going on so you know it's good that you know we can multitask um but but i think that you know each person has its own limit um and so you know one of the things to very important aside from setting boundaries is to to learn to say no um every so often to um and and you know give it to someone else who might find more more enjoyment or happiness fulfilling our role that you don't necessarily have to have to take on you know all of the things I would say that balancing doesn't have to, you don't have to judge yourself if you can't feel like you're balancing it. You don't, I feel like I remember people asking me this question as I was going through, um, just getting through and well, you should have work-life balance. Someone may tell you that. I'm like, I don't understand how anyone has work-life balance. How do you know you have it? Do you have balance all the time? It's not always balanced all the time. So I think that's the thing that's really important just to tell learners that like, we don't always have it together. We might seem that way, but I went through the same things you guys did. I mean, we all went through med school. We all went through residency. We're all, I mean, and then fellowship or whatever you went through. I had days where I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I still have those days and it, it even I probably those are not in training anymore. You'd probably say you some days there's those as well. I mean, but to know, like, you have people around you go to those people, colleagues, you feel comfortable talking about be vulnerable while you're in training, especially when you can quote, make mistakes, um, or know what you're learning, but no matter what, don't judge yourself too much and just i think the biggest thing with balancing that makes that i remind myself is and you what you guys do remind, remind yourself of is that you're human we're all yes we're physicians we're held to a high standard in the medical community and in society but that doesn't mean that you don't have some time to cry here or there or you can't decompress after work, or maybe just the commute if that's all you have, or maybe just the five minutes on the way to get the kids, or whatever it is, just have some me time. Thank you guys so much. Dr. Miner, I saw you had a hand raised. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm balancing and I'm driving and I meant to do the little like wave shout out to you because I was totally identifying with that. But um, I I did put in the chat. You know I I much prefer the term work life integration as opposed to work life balance. If you think about a balance scale, like you add a few grains of sand, it's out of balance. Like that's just an unrealistic expectation completely so i i was just trying to cheer and and i'm old so <laughs> no, no judgment <laughs> yeah i think that's such a, a work-life integration is such a better way to think about it i think i had a someone describe it to me as like you're juggling balls and you have glass balls and you have plastic balls and you can drop the plastic ones if you need to and they'll be okay 
and you just need to figure out what are your glass balls in life that you don't want to throw on the ground um and what plastic ones can you set down for the day and they'll make it through um which i loved thank you guys so much for talking about that um kind of along the same lines have you guys ever been given oh sorry go ahead sorry i think dr newmeister was about to share something oh go ahead oh, I would... well um this is a particularly interesting topic to me because i just had a baby nine weeks ago so um i'm struggling with this um and I knew I would because I was struggling with it before. So now more than ever, but I think the biggest things um, that I have learned about trying to balance or integrate is accepting help when it's offered, um, which is hard to do, especially when you're in a culture where you feel like you need to be doing everything. And I'm kind of like a little bit neurotic. Like I, I have a hard time delegating, <laughs> which I, I need to work on anyway, but accepting help when it, when it's offered, like my dad was downstairs making sure that if the baby woke up, I wouldn't have to go uh, deal with it so that I could be here with you guys. Um, and outsourcing has been huge too. Um, so like saving money so that we could have cleaners come because, you know, you weekends can't be for deep cleaning when you have studying and spending time with family. And then I kind of have this mantra that I started telling myself in the last couple years. And that's whenever I start getting overwhelmed, I start telling myself I can only be in one place. I can only be in one place and that somehow that helps. So. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing. Congratulations, by the way, on your baby. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, equally kind of along that. I love that mantra and I love the kind of the perspective of giving advice to people um, because I think sometimes, you know, you can cling on to something like that in a moment of you know, not despair, but needing a little help. Um, does anyone else have any important piece of advice you've been given or that you'd love to give to students and other, you know, female physicians um, that you think has helped you in difficult times? If I could say, um, answer this one too. Um, so I, I started reading a lot of books on like positivity and wellness and motivation and um, like, how different people learn. I just got really interested in those things. One of the concepts that stuck out to me in in random book was the concept of things being morally neutral. And my mind was blown because you think of things as, you know, I study, that's a good thing, I'm good. Or I didn't study, I watch TV, that makes me bad. Is how my brain was, you know, very like, you know, all or nothing, black and white. Um, so this book said, uh, running a marathon, and a Netflix marathon are morally equivalent. And I was just mind blown by this concept. And I started applying that to everything. Um, if I didn't study, that's it's morally neutral. I'm not a bad person um, or you know, vice versa. If I got asked to be on this panel, that doesn't make me a good person. It's, a, it's an honor, but that doesn't make me good or bad or you know. Um, so I keep telling myself now, because I keep on having to remind myself this is morally neutral. And I think when medical students are coming through, it, it's really hard. You're, you, there's so many pressures of doing research and publishing and presenting at these meetings. And I have to be here and there and everywhere. And it's all, it's all morally neutral. It's crazy. I would say that uh, some advice I've give, gotten a, cu a couple things. My mom always says, never give up. And I know that's a very sweet and simple type thing, but even if you do have some things that may set you back, it doesn't mean you're giving up. So don't judge yourself too much. Another one is take one step at a time. Um, my, my dad says that all the time. And my grandma Nielsen, you should say that a lot. And she would say, if you have take, take, and a whole day, one day at a time. If you can't do that, take an hour at a time. If you can't do that, half hour. If you can't do that, five minutes. If you still can't do that, 30 seconds. Just take as small amount as you need. And and I've, I've, I've felt that with that simple habit, I use one of these, um, like some, it's a, an app on your phone that you can use and there's an on the go area and there's like an SOS or, um, like how you're trying to get to sleep, all these different meditations that you can do, and it's for five, 10, or 20 minutes. 
In the beginning, I couldn't even get through five minutes. And that's okay. It's even the even the one minute that tells me to breathe on my my this, I can't, I couldn't do that at the beginning. I'm like, I don't want to breathe for a minute. That's the longest time ever. Like it's just too much. But you will be able to, you'll get better at it. And I love what Evan said about morally neutral. That's that's something I want to try too. Um, and then the last one is everything's temporary. I think this has helped me get through training. Um, if you're in a rotation that you don't like, it's okay. It's temporary. It's not forever. If you're in it, this this year of fellowship was harder than last year. Everything you start, it's it's hard. It's transitioning. It's hard. But no, it's temporary. And even if you get a, a job later, it doesn't mean it has to be forever. There's there's choices you have. There's ways to change the way you want your life to be. And, and there really is a lot of opportunity that you have. For me, my uh, father had a take on Andrew Carnegie and always taught me anything worth having is worth working hard for. Um, so sometimes I think I forget how blessed I am um, to be able to serve. Um, because instead I focus on how busy I am. So a lot of those grateful journal moments where I try to remind myself, what am I grateful for? And as I've gone through up in life, um, my husband had open heart surgery about a year and a half ago. I was about ready to break at that time, guys. And two women, I, I don't think they're all on the panel still, but um, uh, actually three women, uh, Dr. Hanami Adrizi, who I think I'm calling now and had to run, uh, Dr. Michelle Miner, who is driving away somewhere, and Dr. Vidya Prakash um, all found out at different times heard a lot of personal support and professional support. Dr. Adrizi took over running the hospitalist group. Dr. Minor um, is one of my fellow APDs. Um, and to talk to say, hey, I'm take I'll take that with my um, and so I think it's as I've gone through life and recognize what to be grateful for, it's a lot easier to say, I'm grateful for good health because there for a while, we didn't know if my husband or not. He actually had um, um, episodes where he was at risk for sudden death. Um, and that really changes your perspective. Um, aside from making you more grateful for your, what your patients experience of it. Um, but I think it was, kindness and those three women telling me whatever I was doing was good enough um, and more than good enough. It, it was still excellent, even though I felt like I could barely hold it together some days. Thank you. Um, was there anyone else that wanted to share any other nuggets of advice? Um, I, I really appreciate your vulnerability and allowing yourself to open up like that with us. And um, I know that that is often the most difficult part in even beginning to seek out help. So um, I, I think it's uh, important and helpful for us to hear at any stage. Dr. Bhandari, were you going to share something? I saw that you had come off of mute. Yeah, I mean, um, um, what I was going to say is that um, uh, asking this, you know, uh, like others have said, asking for help is not something uh, we should be, you know, um, we should be afraid of or we should be thinking, oh, okay, you know, I, I'm supposed to be perfect. I'm supposed to be doing 20 things at the same time and should be, you know, great at everything. I think we are all type A personalities and we try to, you know, uh, put ourselves at that thing that, okay, you know, uh, I can do this, 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 and this. But then, you know, you have to understand that, again, like the said, we are human, right? We are human, even though we are doctors, <laughs> we are human. And what we preach our patients, right? I think sometimes we need to preach ourselves. I think that <laughs> because when we, we, I see, you know, we, we see a lot of, uh, uh, mental health issues in family medicine, stress, acute stress disorder, this anxiety. And we are trying to um, uh, counsel our patients, like, you know what, take one day at a time, take you know time off, take time to think about yourself. 
uh, things are temporary, but then um, we don't apply that to ourselves. You know, so I think once we start accepting that, yes, we are, uh, we are humans, we are vulnerable and whatever we are preaching the world, we need to sometimes stand in the mirror and try to preach ourselves. Uh, I think that would be very helpful. <laughs> and uh, saying a no, uh, saying no, I cannot do it. Uh, I'm not feeling bad about it. And um, let people think whatever they, they can. And <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've, I've learned to say no. I've learned to say no, I cannot do that. And uh, people can uh, judge me, do whatever, because this is my life. I, I know what I can do and what my limits are and what will make me happy and keep me keep me sane. Um, but that, that's what I would say, you know. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was going to jump on that, um, you know, perfectionism type A personality kind of thing that Dr. Bandari had mentioned. Because, you know, one of the things, and again, this is something I got from Dr. Prakash. Um, is that, you know, she, she, when, when I was starting attending life or when I was making that transition, I did not get any of a lot. I had a lot of backlog in terms of notes. Um, and now that, that the, really the biggest barrier I had was my perfectionism or my constant, you know, struggle to try to be perfect, which doesn't exist. I later find out, um, but you know, that just sometimes good enough is okay. Um, you know, it's better uh, done than perfect, um, is what I learned from Dr. Prakash. So, you know, you know, just hopping on that whole type A thing, um, you know, perfectionism, it doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's like the, one of the biggest barriers to progress. So, you know, just accept that good enough is good enough and then move on and get other stuff done. So yeah, good enough is okay. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to, I love, uh, a lot of what you're sharing already are like things that I want almost like packaged up and written down just to save and refer to. Um, I know that you, Dr. Neumeister, you already shared some books, uh, that you've used that have been helpful and, and the app that you described, Dr. Nielsen, are, are there any other resources or um, books, networking, like events that you've been exposed to that uh, you think would be helpful to share with us and uh, could, um, you know, help us as we all continue to navigate this world and move forward? I go to the Global Leadership Summit every year. It's a leadership summit from people from all walks of life. Um, it's not just medicine. It can be business. It can be religion. Um, it can be government, um, financial banks. Um, and I think what's beautiful about that is sometimes in medicine, to other scientists or doctors for answers and answers from people outside my field. Um, and that's what that global leadership summit provides me. It's virtual. So it fits into my busy life. I don't have to drive somewhere. I don't have to pay for something. I just have to pay for the conference, which um, actually is quite affordable for um, um, a teacher. If you can state you're a teacher and state your institution, they'll check it out $80. Um, and it's a two day event. And I would really um, encourage everyone to try it out. Dr. Miner got me into it, asked me for five years. And I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't. And ever since she got me there, I've been a faithful attendee for about seven, eight years now. Um, the other thing that really helps is something completely not medical at all. Um, it is on Netflix. No, on HBO Max. And, um, videos can get there and they talk about the making of chocolate in a very calm and neutral voice. And my favorite one is the making of noodles <laughs> and it's written, read by Oscar Isaac, um, the actor, if you guys know who that is. Um, yeah, unfortunately you don't see Oscar, but you do get to hear his voice. And I can't tell you guys the number of times, like as I'm dealing with issues at work or at home and different things, and I can't slow my head down. I throw on that calm app, <laughs> making of noodles and we 
in China and I'm like right out. So something deeper and something super easy. Perfect. Anyone else have any other um, books, resources, podcasts, uh, community networks that? Uh... I, would, I would say that, so I don't have cable and I don't really pay attention to the news very much, but I would say that something I get the news from that's quick and easy, if it's something like, it's called Skimmed This. I don't know if anyone's heard about it. You can make it, it's an email that you can sign up for. There's they're, they're now having like just texts that come through or there's a podcast and it's skimmed with uh, S-K-I-M-M-E-D or I don't think it has the E in it, skimmed this. But like even on one and a half time on the podcast, it's not too quick, but it's still like maybe eight to 30 minutes at most. And like, it's like every Thursday it comes out. So I like that because it's, and it's not as, it's not one side or the other political wise. So I feel like it's more to the point and you can always get back at me about that. If it, if you feel like maybe it is, and I didn't realize, but, um, <laughs> but I think it's, it gets some good news. It talks about like, obviously what the war is going on right now. I mean, all, all the other things outside of medicine and even brings up some medicine too, but it's just kind of fun as well. And I think the news is always so negative that I like, I just want what's happening and that's it. And then get out of here. <laughs> Agreed. Any other thoughts? Um, yes. Dr. Bandari, did you go? Oh, or no? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, what I would say is, uh, I mean, I don't use a lot of apps or uh, um, I don't read a lot of books other than those I have I had to or have to, uh, but and I don't look at news. Um, but uh, so what my go to is I uh, I've tried over time to find something which, you know. Uh, makes me um, like happy uh, and I honestly uh, where I found happiness was cooking. I mean, uh, so whenever I'm very stressed out, I cook. And I cook a lot, <laughs> and uh, believe me, I I find that so much de-stressing. I mean, it's just that uh, by accident I found. Okay, you know what? The days when I'm super stressed, I'll go ahead, and that's been a good thing because that takes care of two things: <laughs> the cooking part and the, and the the food comes out really good. Um, the second thing I have uh, done over time, ever since I was a child, I always wanted to learn dance, but things never happen. And finally, I have registered for a dance class and I'm faithfully practicing every day. Just like I'm trying to do my notes, I'm practicing my dance because I really want to do good on that, just like that type of personality. But um, if you find something, you know, which de-stresses you, which is completely out of this, you know, medicine and um, and uh, maybe it's cleaning the house sometimes, you know, some my, my mom used to always do that whenever she would she would go clean, 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 clean. <laughs> I would like, oh, that's that OCD mode, but that would be stress her. <laughs> so for me, it's the cooking and the dancing. So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, I'm I eat, so I need to be near you when you're cooking. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do as far as um i wanted to be mindful of the time i wanted to see if we had any questions that were posed in the chat if uh we wanted to address those if not do any of our lovely panelists have any other thoughts from some of the previous questions we've asked that you thought about something later and maybe didn't get to mention We have a lot of comments in the chat, no questions. Okay, okay. I'm not surprised because of the comments because you guys have all shared a lot of um, helpful information and um, I hope that his, this has felt like a space that is warm and um, inviting and I, I know that we are also appreciative of the wealth of knowledge and experience that you all have and uh, your willingness to share it with us 
as uh, learners. Um, I I don't know if I I wanted to see if, if there's maybe like a brief moment if one other person wanted to share anything. I don't want to uh, lose you just yet, but if it's okay with you guys, if anyone has any questions, uh, would we be able to provide your emails if uh, you can let us know? And um, we can send that out. I'll try and see if we can compile some of the examples of resources that you guys have mentioned and put in the chat. And we can put that together and send that out through AMWA. We also, just a little plug, we have an AMWA event coming up this spring. I know Rachel is on here and she is planning it for us uh, in, in, uh, with our partner organization, Girls on the Run. It is Saturday, May 14th, uh, and we are wanted as volunteers. I'm not sure if Rachel, you wanted to provide any other info. Um, so yeah, that's, you, I mean, you covered most of it. It's on Saturday, May 14th. They want us at the water station, um, like water station, also for a first aid station. I'm actually a coach for girl on the run this year. Um, and the girls are so stinking cute and they're so excited to run. And so there's, there's going to be a bunch of girls out there and you get to see their cute little faces as they finish their 5k. So if you have free time and. I know after this chat, I'll, I know a lot of people don't have free time, but if on Saturday, May 14th, you feel like you want to come out and cheer on some third through fifth grade girls, we would love to have you. Perfect. And Thank you. I know I sent an email earlier to the um, medical students, but I can also have that forwarded to you all as well for the sign up link if you want to or know someone that might want to. <laughs> well, I want to, I'll wrap up, I guess, um, at this point now, I wanted to thank you guys all again, really, uh, it, I feel like our key takeaways are that work life balance isn't a real thing. We're going to do work life integration. Um, we're gonna keep listening to the advice post from our mentors. Uh, this is. Nothing is forever, even though it feels like it sometimes. Uh, and, you know, we are learning when to say no, respecting our boundaries and continuing to move forward and be successful. I hope. <laughs> thank you guys again. And thank you so much to Dr. Prakash for helping uh, get us together with our panelists and for helping set up this event for us. We are so excited to finally get a collaboration event with AMWA and AWIMS together. And I hope this is something that we can continue in the future with kind of future generations of learners as we, Jasmine and I, move forward and we have uh, our next board members join us hopefully shortly. So I want to thank you, Jasmine and Emily, for phenomenally facilitating this discussion. You did a fantastic job. And I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, you inspire me. Um, every one of you, you inspire me. I always learn something from you every time I hear you speak. Um, so many thanks and thanks to everybody for joining us for a great discussion. And uh, I will disseminate the recording as well. So we have access to it and I am copying the chat. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. You. Enjoy have the rest of your evening. I wasn't sure if you want.